Hi everybody. Welcome to our first Markov Chains and Processes lecture. Our setup for the lectures is going to look like this, where uh, there's a, a shot of me talking and um, there's a tablet that is kind of taking the place of our blackboard that I'll write on. A lot of the video of me talking will be kind of like this because I'm looking down at the tablet as I write. And that's not really super useful, but students have said that it's helpful to see a face uh, just to make some kind of human connection, even if it's not, you know, uh, so well choreographed like that. Um, and once in a while, I'll pause and look up at the camera and talk uh, directly. Uh, but most of the time, I'll really kind of be sort of staring down like this. It's hard to write um, otherwise. But yeah, so let's just dive right in. Um, today's lecture is really just sort of an overview of the content of the course. It's a little bit more crude and maybe slightly less formal uh, than the remaining lectures. Um, but let's just go right into it. So I'm going to start off with just a bit of an introduction. So this lecture is all about this introduction. And we're just going to kind of show you a little bit about um, the the type of problems that we're going to be solving. So we're going to look at a few examples today, but we're not really going to do them in detail. We're just going to kind of set them up and see what 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 kind of example problems we would be able to do as the module progresses. And I'll point out which chapters these things come from as we go. So the first thing I want to do is sort of introduce a couple of terms. Um, so we'll make some kind of definitions, sort of, sort of crude definitions. So I want to define a stochastic process. And this, as you've probably seen or maybe have seen, is the title of one of the of, of the book that this module is largely based on. And so let's just talk a little bit about what this is. So this is a stochastic process is, is a model uh, for a random system evolving in time. Now, I think that the word random here gets misunderstood, um, or at least it did by me when I was a student. When I heard this word, I thought what it meant was a much more specific thing than it does mean. Uh, so, for example, when you use a random number generator on a computer, you have some picture of your mind of what that means. This is a little less specific than that. So random really just means probabilistic in nature. So some sort of system, so it's a model for a random system um, that you can't or maybe don't know how to describe deterministically. You can only say something about the probability that it is in some certain configuration or something like that. You don't, you know, maybe you have some very specific information about that probability. It's not completely random as, as I would have interpreted it when I was a student and sort of misunderstanding things. Um, so this is, this is a model for a random system evolving in time. And the evolving in time part goes along with the word process, but the random or probabilistic part, so this bit here, uh, this is what's going along with the word stochastic, right? So that's a sort of a, a crude way to define things, not, not really a mathematician's favorite way to write out a definition, say. Um, and next I want to introduce a Markov process. And again, we'll do better with, we'll make better definitions um, as we go. Um, but this is just sort of for a rough uh, discussion uh, today. And so a Markov process is what I'll call a memoryless stochastic process. If you uh, saw on the module handbook, I had a little quote uh, about uh, a key to have a good one of the keys to happiness is a bad memory. This is just meant to be a reference to Markov processes uh, being memoryless stochastic process processes.
Okay, so this is a, a memoryless Markov. Uh, sorry, <laughs> a Markov process. So the key words here are Markov. That's a person. That's based on a person's name. Uh, uh, it's a memoryless stochastic process. And what we mean by that uh, was sort of very vaguely imply what it means. It means that the future of the process. Uh, is it only depends on the present, not on the past. Has a certain admirable quality, admirable quality to it. So a Markov process is a stochastic process, but it's one where the future state of the process. Uh, is only determined by the current state of it, not not by the past state. Um, and again, we, we will be giving much better definitions later, but let's just go with this. Um, and so I want to start off with just talking about a couple of example problems. So one example problem, I'll call this example number one. Um, maybe I'll put a little color for examples, say. Um, uh, so example number one um, is going to be a famous problem called a drunken walk. Also kind of an entertaining topic. Um, and so the drunken walk problem takes a variety of forms, uh, but I'm going to set it up like in the following way. I'm not going to do it super precisely here. I'm just going to kind of lay it out. Let's say that there's a, a pub somewhere over here. Uh, so this is a pub. And there's a person that's uh, departing from the pub um, and walking towards their house. And so we'll put their house off to the right. Uh, let's see, so I want to do this. Their house is just going to look like this, or their home, like this, off to the right. And let's say that there are some kind of boundaries uh, that the person has to deal with. Uh, and of course, the person's been at the pub for a while, so they're drunk, um, and they kind of stumble about. And so the, let's say the boundaries look like this. Uh, up here on the top, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just stick with blue all the way. Um, up here on the top, oops, um, there's a wall. I'll move that a bit. A wall as in like something that the guy could, uh, the person could lean on, not a wall as in like to fall over. Uh, um, but so that's just some sort of wall that they could lean on if they wanted to. And then on the other side, uh, let's say that there's water or like a river. So along here, we'll say that there's a river. A river of the sort that the person could fall into. Um, and so this is the construction, oops, um, of the problem. So I'm going to put the house kind of better aligned there. Um, and the, the idea here is that um, the person starts off at the pub and maybe these dots a little bit bigger. Um, hopefully that's not too big. Oh, that's too big. <laughs> we'll say that the, the person starts off um, at the pub like this, and every time step, um, actually I'm going to move the pub so it's directly on top of a little intersection here, um, and every time step the person moves one grid point on my little graph paper here to the right towards home. So let's say that they're not so drunk that they start turning away from home. They're always walking towards home. You could you could adjust the problem uh, so that that was part of it too, if you wanted to. Um, and let's say that every step toward home, they so so the fact that they always move one step towards home makes makes this direction um, a proxy for time. So this is like time. So let's say it's a, it's a proxy for time. It's a spatial dimension, but um, and so the person. Let's see which dot did I want that one? I think um, every every time step moves one block over one block over my graph paper. And they move either one step toward the wall or one step toward the river. Uh, you could also set it up so that they had some chance of uh, moving uh, just completely horizontally without going towards the river or the wall. 
Um, but let's say that that's the case. And so let's say the next step, uh, the first step happens and you go over here. Uh, the next step, you go back towards the wall, uh, go towards the wall again, maybe down towards the wall again, and then you get near to the wall. And let's say we set this up in such a way that when you're at the wall, if you try to, to step uh, toward the wall, what happens is you just stay where you were uh, like that. Uh, you don't you don't actually uh, go into the wall, of course, and nor do you bounce off of it. Say you just you just well, I guess you could say this means you bounced off of it, uh, but you're just sort of leaning and dragging along against the wall. Um, so th this is sort of a special condition. How do you deal with the side that's the wall? And then um, you know the person keeps on going, and it could happen. So depending on where these dots went, the person could end up walking all the way home or they could uh, go into the river. And so let's say there's sort of two endings. Um, so ending, oops, I keep forgetting about the thickness there. So end, the ends could be river or home. So either they're gonna make it home or they're gonna land in the river. Um, and so the, this is the the, uh, the example of the drunken walk problem. Um, and so if the if the horizontal end line is a, a proxy direction is a proxy for time, then this is sort of a proxy for well, it's not really a proxy, but it's a position. So it's really sort of like a one dimensional problem that evolves in time, um, even though it's in two dimensions spatially. So what kind of things would we be able to do with this problem after we kind of went through the module and learned all the different pieces? So what Markov theory can provide, so Markov theory provides the following things, among other things. So these are just examples of the types of things you could compute um, with Markov theory. So one is uh, you could you could compute the expected number of steps you might say well isn't the expected number of steps the number of steps it takes to get home uh, but remember they could fall into the river so that might happen after just two steps the way I've written it, done it, drawn it up there right could have could have gone straight into the river um, and you could compute something like the probability of making it home. And the problem could be set up in such a way that uh, as they move, uh, they have this probability of, of going either towards the river or towards the wall. It could be that that probability is the same, so it's a 50-50 chance, or it could be uh, maybe they're on a hill um, and they're much more likely to fall, go towards the river or more likely to go towards the wall. So you can imagine a bunch of different constructions for this. Uh, but this is one famous example uh, of a Markov uh, chain problem that we could do. Um, and we won't, we won't be doing that one, uh, but I just wanted to sort of set it up uh, so you can see what it is. Um, now let's look at a second example. Um, so this is going to be our example two. We're going to look at three different examples in this little lecture. And again, they're just illustrated. We're not really solving anything here, just kind of giving you a flavor for what we would be able to do. Um, so example two uh, also has a kind of an entertaining title. It's called The Gambler's Ruin. Sorry. As you'll see, my writing is not the best. Um, it really, for this to work, it requires you to kind of be listening. Uh, uh, this is how I, all, most of my <laughs> lectures as a student were. It was dif difficult often to tell what the person was writing if you weren't kind of following along. So you, you'll want to be following along uh, and listening as we go. And there should be closed captioning or de semi-decent captioning on these videos. Okay, so the gambler's ruin problem is set up like this. Um, you say we have two players or gamblers. And let's give them exciting names A and B. 
right? So these are the two different gamblers or players. And for this one, every time step, uh, they play a game. So every step or in time, they play a game, play a single game. or make a single gamble. Um, and the game works like this. Uh, so the probability of A winning a game is a uh, little p. All right, and so that's fixed. Uh, so this is the idea here. Um, you have two possible outcomes, either player A wins or player B wins. And the probability of player A winning is P, all right? Um, and what happens after the game after the game is that the loser of the game pays the winner one token or one pound or one dollar or whatever. One token. Right? Uh, so that's the construction. And you repeat, they just keep on playing. Uh, so you repeat until one A or B is ruined. Uh, and ruined means no tokens. Uh, so this means no tokens. Right, so this is the construction, or this is the, the sort of layout of this problem, and what kind of things can we get from Markov theory? Markov theory can do the following kinds of things. It can compute the probability of A being ruined. Right, so that's one thing we would be able to compute. Um, and I think we will compute these two different things when we get to this example. Uh, and we can also compute the expected number of games. So one of these gamblers is going to be ruined. Um, well, I guess it, if you think of it, it doesn't have to work out that way, right? It could, it could be that it just goes on forever. Um, and they just keep exchanging tokens, and neither one of them ever runs out. Um, but let's say um, that the ex in, w in which case the expected number of games might be infinite. Um, but one of the things we'd be able to compute is the expected number of games here um, before before the end. And again, the end in this case is um, that one of the gamblers is ruined. Okay, so both we've, we've seen two little sketched examples here. So both examples, we're going to look more at the gambler's ruin, but both examples are of the same type. They're of a type of problem called random walks. Um, and we'll look at those in chapter three. Right after we do things like formally introduce uh, uh, go go through our preliminaries and formally introduce Markov processes. Mark, or I guess we'll have done Markov chains at that point. Um, but so they both come under this title of random walk, and I think you can kind of see. Certainly, the first one. So I'll just scroll back up here. Certainly, this is this is describing literally some sort of a walk. Um, so that seems like a fitting name. But you can see how this goes, right? The 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 drunken person kind of is trying to get home. They may get home, they may not. So it's a little bit like the, the gambler in the sense that they may uh, win all the money or they may lose all their money, the losing being kind of like falling into the river. Um, and there's a relatively simple set of rules. They either get a little bit more money or a little bit less money each time. And so the, the problem is relatively similar in construction. So, so that's why they're both called random walks. Um, and there are lots of different applications where you can find a random walk type of problem. But as I've advertised, 
Um, we aren't going to look exhaustively at all of the different examples and applications. What we're going to do is look at a couple, a few, a handful of very classical example type problems and work through them in detail. So that's that's the sort of spirit of this module, what we're going to try to do. Okay, um, so let's let's look a little bit more uh, at the setup for example two. All right, so setup. Like, how would we actually try to do this problem? So setup, we won't really do it, but I'm just going to show you how to kind of set it up. Setup, for example, two. All right. So we're just going to name some variables and kind of talk about how they change. So we'll say that, uh, let's say that the number of tokens that A has uh, after game number n, so after playing game number n, uh, we'll call that x sub n. Right, so x sub n, uh, this is a's number of tokens after game n. Right, um, and so we'll say x zero, that's the initial number of tokens that a has, so after game zero, I don't know what that's before game number one. Um, this is, uh, we'll give it some value. Uh, so let's say it's, this is actually equal to, I guess we can say all these are kind of equal to. Uh, this is equal to little a, and this is some fixed number. All right, so we'll call that little a. Um, that's the number of tokens that a starts with. And later we'll introduce the number of tokens that b starts with, we'll call that little b. Um, sometimes you can have little b be infinite, but little a isn't. Um, so anyway, there's lots of different varieties of, of how you do this. Um, and then we'll say, so x at some time greater than zero, so this is meant to be n greater than zero, right? So this is equal to whatever it was before, n minus one, uh, plus zn, right? Now, both x, n, and z, n, you should remember from uh, your uh, MT2504, I guess, or other classes, uh, these are both uh, discrete random variables. And I'll, I'll write this often as d, r, v for discrete random variable and i'll often just like write rv for random variable right so let's suppose i think the way i had this one constructed is every game you either win a token uh player a either wins a token or loses a token and so we'll say uh that zn is equal to it has two possible values it can be either one or minus one so you step forward or up or down uh, so it's one with probability p, right? So that's the chance of a winning, uh, the probability of a winning. So that's that would make z n one. Um, and if a didn't win, that happens with probability. These are the only two outcomes, right? So this is probability one minus p. Sorry about that. Right, then Zn is minus one. Uh, so that's kind of how you would begin setting up the mathematics of this. Um, and you would carry on from there and start to try to do a calculation using something, using uh, the, this uh, distribution for Zn, you should be able to figure out kind of what happens. And, and we, will, we will do that. Um, now, before I, I kind of talk a little bit more, I, I was gonna look at one more example, but I also wanna introduce some terminology uh, for the kind of different um, quantities that we might want to talk about in this particular problem. So these are sort of some definitions. But they're not in the sense that they're crude. <laughs> uh, come on, pen. So these are some definitions. Um, but again, this is pretty crude, uh, crudely defined, barely defining them at all, to be honest. Uh, but so let's say this, we'll say that a, st a stochastic process uh, 
uh, in the in the above description uh, is going to be or well this this is just in general uh, it's some set of x evaluated at t such that little t uh, which we think of as time um, is an element of some bigger set capital T or some of some set capital T um, this is a collection of random variables um, And so that, that's what the stochastic process is. It's the collection of random variables x of t, right? Um, and capital T is called the index set. Right, so we've made a few definitions. Maybe I'll we'll give them some, some colors here. So these are some definitions, sort of. Uh, we've sort of defined a stochastic process here. Um, and we've sort of defined uh, the index set, capital T, right? Uh, so let's introduce a few more terms. Uh, so there's there's two possible types of T that we will focus on, or index sets. So we're going to look at discrete time processes. Right, and so for those guys... Uh, the index set, uh, sorry about that, the index set is a subset of the integers. Um, and we often then use the naming x of t. Sorry, something's blocking my view here. Let me fix this up. We'll name x of t x with a subscript of t. Um, if this is a sub subset of the integers, right? So that's a discrete time process. Um, a continuous time process has a different sort of index set. Um, and so we'll say uh, you can write t as an interval uh, in the real numbers. as a subset of the real numbers. Okay, so those are the two types of uh, time, the two types of processes that we might look at right now, uh, discrete time processes or continuing time, pro continuous time processes. Um, and then I want to introduce, and so these are kind of definitions again, so discrete time process, continuous time process. Um, and then I want to introduce one more term, the state space. So the state space. So the state space, we'll call that S. Uh, so this is the set of all possible values of X of T. Set. <laughs> set of all possible. Of x of t, all possible values of x of t. Uh, again, sorry about my, my writing is kind of clumsy. I'll try to work on that a bit. Um, it works better for me on the blackboard than on the tablet, but I think it's okay. Oh, and I should say um, I've written a and b here. These a and b have nothing to do with the number of tokens uh, in the gambler's ruin problem. Um, these are, I should, probably should have used different letters here. Um, in fact, why don't we do that? Why don't we just say, why don't we just call these guys like T1, T2, um, or you could give them other names if you want, alpha and beta, I don't know, whatever you like. It's it's meant to be the boundaries of that interval. Okay, um, so the state space S is sort of defined here, right? Um, and now what, what kind of S and T did we have in example two? So in example two, Right, so that's the gambler's ruin problem. 
right? Um, if you think about these, so t is the the set of times available, and so that's discrete, right? So t is discrete, and s is the state space. Uh, so that's the values, possible values of x of t, which is the number of tokens. That's also discrete. So for this one, both s and t were discrete. All right. Um, and you can even write out what they are. So s, right, so what is this set? If it's 0 if a has lost all of its money. Uh, 1, 2, and so on. And the biggest it could be uh, is a plus b, right, where b is uh, the number of tokens that b initially had. Right, so that's the state space for the gambler's ruin problem that we set up. And t, well, so we didn't, there's not a lot of restriction on what t could be. Um, we could always, however, map it onto these, so 0, 1, 2, and so on, right? Uh, so that's the state space, and that's the index set for the gambler's ruin problem. Okay, we'll set up one more example. Uh, it'll be a little bit different in, in structure, not a random walk problem. So this is example 3. Uh, was I using green for these guys, I think? Um, and example three is going to be a parking lot, or uh, as we say over here, a car park. All right, so this is a car park, and this is an example of something called a queuing system. And we're going to see these guys in chapter six. Uh, so this is one of the other examples we'll spend a lot of time on. Um, and the idea behind the parking lot is the following. So let's say that the parking lot has some kind of restrictions. So it's got uh, it's got room for some fixed number of cars. So room for capital N cars. Um, and we'll say that ca cars arrive and depart at random times. And if the lot is full, or if the car park is full, then arriving cars leave. In other words, they don't arrive. Um, okay, um, and so then we'll, we'll make, so our state space is going to be the set of all values of x of t, and x of t here is going to be equal to the number of cars parked uh, at time t. Okay, um, and then it would be the case that we write x of t plus h as follows. So we'd say it's orig it's whatever it was at x of t. So this is, you can sort of see where this memoryless uh, property is kind of coming in. Um, it depends on the present, not on the past or anything like that. Uh, and then we say plus a, which is some function of t and h, minus d, which is some other function of t and h. And here a and d stand for the number of arrivals and the number of departures. So a and d, these are the arrivals and the departures in the interval Let's say it goes from t to t plus h. And let's say it's 
inclusive of the t plus h. Okay, and so these things, these are random variables. And we might know their distributions. So you may know their distributions. Okay. Now what about the uh, the index set and the state space for this guy? So what is S? What could S possibly be? be? Right, so S is the number of parked cars, right? So this could be 0, 1, and that could go up to a maximum of capital N, right? So this is a discrete space, state space. And the index set T, well, so this is, it starts at 0, say, uh, let's just say that it does. Uh, and in principle, uh, it goes on forever, right? Um, so this is continuous. Uh, not just because it goes on forever, uh, but because the t is in, does not come in little discrete steps, right? Um, and so what kind of things would we be able to compute? So again, this is this we're not going to do any of these today. Um, we're going to spend time on each one of these things as we go. Um, but what uh, what we could do, uh, so we could compute the following things. So these are examples of things that we will compute things like this. Uh, you could compute the expected number of cars parked. Oops. Um, the other thing you could compute uh, that we will compute, there are other things, of course, also, um, but you could compute the proportion of time that the lot is, or the park, car park is full. Right, which you might think of as a probability. Uh, so these are examples of things that you could compute. So that's mostly, that's all pretty much all I wanted to talk to you about today. So we've looked at three little example problems. Uh, so this was example three, start way back up there. And we'll see more about that in chapter six and the random walk problems we'll look at in chapter three. And I think this gives a flavor kind of of where we're going uh, in terms of uh, actual like information that we're gonna discuss. But also I think it should give you a feeling for kind of how it's constructed the module that we're going to look at these like kind of classical problems and, and study them. There are of course lots of different examples, um, parking lots and uh, drunk people walking are not really super hot topics <laughs> out in the world today, but these are all things that could be extended to a variety of different contexts. And we are not gonna exhaustively try to work out how one does that. Uh, we're instead gonna focus on these kind of traditional classical problems. Uh, and develop uh, Markov theory uh, in, in the context of those. Okay, uh, that's all I have to say for you today, and uh, I'll see you in the next lecture. Bye.